Hello and good morning, everyone, and welcome to our cardiology grand rounds at Houston Methodist and the Baker Heart and Vascular Center. I'm Bill Zogby. I'm the chair of cardiology here at Houston Methodist. And with me this morning is Dr. Barry Trachtenberg, also who does not need a, an introduction. He's the director of our cardio-oncology program, associate professor of cardiology here at Houston Methodist. And welcome to our Grand Rounds. This is a very special Grand Rounds today. Before getting uh, introducing our special guest today, I'd like to remind you of a uh, few things here as how to get in touch with us. We'd like to, this to be interactive at the end of the session. And uh, you could do that two ways, by texting DeBakey to 37607 or going online to Paul Ev and enter DeBakey and ask your questions. And I think uh, we'd like that to be interactive. Well, um, this is a special Grand Rounds, at least for me and many of us here in Houston. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Beacom Boskert. Uh, Beacom is, uh, uh, does not need an introduction. She is really a most prominent uh, investigator, educator, and clinician in the field of advanced heart failure. She is the Mary uh, and uh, Gordon uh, Kane. A professor uh, and chair at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. She's also the uh, uh, associate provost for faculty affair at uh, Baylor College of Medicine and uh, really has made her mark in heart failure. Uh, for me it is special because uh, she's a dear friend over the years, a trainee. We're most proud of you Dr. Beacom for all of the achievements that you've done. Uh, She's also just immediate past president of the Heart Failure uh, Society of America and also has had her mark on heart failure you know, throughout the country and, and the world. Uh, very published and uh, her publications really span all the field of heart failure and I think this is her specialty, her prominence. And most importantly, she's been engaged in the guidelines of uh, heart failure uh, she was the uh, co-chair of the current guidelines for uh, heart failure treatment from the ACC and the American Heart Association. Uh, she is an associate editor for Circulation Heart Failure, also the section chief editor for Jack regarding heart failure uh, itself and, and uh, uh, the uh, also past chair for the Council on Heart Failure for the American College of Cardiology. She's been also recognized and uh, so appropriately for so many of her contributions, particularly in education and research. Uh, she was the Proctor Harvey a Young Teacher Award uh, from the ACC back in 2005, the most gifted teacher from the American College of Cardiology, also the Barbara and Corbin uh, um, uh, Educator Award from the Baylor College of Medicine and so many other accolades uh, that Dr. Bo Boskert has, has received over the years. Uh, Beacom, it's a pleasure having you here with us today. I know this was uh, overdue back in March where we were gonna actually host you and have dinner together. You know, things happened <laughs> this past year, very unusual. I think we're very glad that we have a vaccine now that I know most of us uh, are going to get it and then control this pandemic, but it is great to have you here with us, although virtually, uh, to tell us about what is the latest in guideline medical therapy for heart failure. Welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zogby, for that gracious introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be among friends, colleagues, and most importantly, former mentors. And uh, I am honored to uh, present on the guideline-directed medical therapy in heart failure. What is the standard of care currently and uh, coming in 2021? These are my disclosures. And I would like to first start with heart failure with reduced EF. Um, the treatment of heart failure has evolved significantly in the last two years. Uh, creating the need for this uh, review of what should be the standard of uh, care in heart failure in 2021 and beyond, uh, beyond the existing guidelines by the ACCAHA, which were last updated in 2017, and by ESC in 2016. Just as a reminder, the main area of update in 2017 entailed the recognition of the combination of angiotensin receptor and nep nepralizin inhibitor 
sacubitor valsartan. Neprilizin is an endopeptidase that sits across the membrane of the variety of the cells across the body and breaks down peptides such as natriuretic peptides, bradykinin, angiotensin 1 or 2, or even peptides such as amyloid beta, glucagon, and or uh, encephalins. Uh, thus, neprilizin inhibition alone may result in increased levels of beneficial peptides such as ANP, BNP, which are good, as well as maladaptive peptides such as angiotensin 2. Therefore, the beneficial effects may be offset by the increased activity of RAS, requiring the combination of neprilizin with RAS inhibition, which was initially attempted with ACE inhibitors but resulted in significant rates of increased angioedema and subsequent development of angiotensin receptor and neprilizin inhibitor, or ARNI, with secubitral valsartan, which was highly successful in reducing cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations in the practice-changing paradigm trial. Secubitral so, so valsartan was well-tolerated and uh, had lesser incidence of hyperkalemia or a rise in creatinine compared to enalapril, uh, but had more rates of hypotension in that trial. Our current standard therapies in patients with HEPREF therefore include ACE inhibitors or ARB or ARNI, beta blockers, immunocorticoid receptor antagonists, hydralazine isosorbide for African Americans, and consideration of ivabradine, a heart rate slowing agent if heart rate is over 70. Several landmark trials in the last two years since these guidelines provide the evidence to expand options for drug therapies in patients with heart failure with reduced EF. These include studies with sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors or SGLT2 inhibitors, commonly used as a medication in diabetes, which prevent the reabsorption of glucose through the kidneys, facilitating glucose excretion in the urine, but their hypothesized cardiovascular effects appear to be beyond their glucosuric effects as they are known to reduce cardiac preload, afterload, vascular tone, and they result in natriuresis and improve myocardial energetics and substrate utilization. Though we do not know the exact mechanisms of action, SGLT2 inhibitors have been demonstrated to be beneficial in symptomatic heart failure patients with reduced EF, regardless of diabetes. In two landmark trials, DAPA-HF with dapagliflozin, and emperor reduce with empagliflozin, including patients with HEFREF with EF less than or equal to 40%, NYHA class 2 to 4 heart failure and elevated natriuretic peptide levels, and half of the trial being with patients without diabetes, and exclusion criteria including systolic blood pressure less than 95 or 100, and EGFR all the way down to less than or equal to uh, 20. Both studies show that treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors was very effective in reducing cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations in patients with HEFREF. The risk reduction was very similar in both of these studies by approximately 25% on top of very optimized standard background therapy. And the benefits started early after randomization with clear separation of the curves early on. And the magnitude of the benefit was very similar, regardless of the diabetes status among HEPREF patients with or without diabetes in both of these trials. Furthermore, these new therapies have beneficial effects beyond heart failure or cardiovascular disease. SGLT2 inhibitors reduce the decline in EGFR, renal outcomes, and progression of CKD as shown on top. And similarly, as a reminder, ARNI also reduces the decline in EGFR. So these new therapies have beneficial effects uh, with evidence of slowing of progression of kidney disease. In summation, the magnitude of the risk reduction with SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with reduced EF is very robust. As I mentioned, 25% risk reduction in combined cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, 30% risk reduction in first or recurrent heart failure events, and approximately a 50% risk reduction in decline in CKD events. Additionally, a recent meta-analysis of these two trials supported that SGLT2 inhibitors is associated with a reduction in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular death. 
From the patient's perspective, because we always get this question, there's also evolving evidence that these new life-saving saving therapies, the SGLT2 inhibitors and RNA, also result in meaningful improvements in quality of life measures. As shown, SGLT2 inhibitors, specifically dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, were associated with meaningful and significant improvements in quality of life measures in DAPA, HF, and Emperor trials. And ARNI, Sacubitro Valsartan, also is associated with an improvement in quality of life, and that has been shown in the Paradigm trial. Additionally, studies with ARNI, and very recently, as of November, with SGLT2 inhibitors, we now have evidence that these agents are associated with improvements in LV volumes and ejection fraction, suggesting or implying reversal of remodeling in HEPREF patients with these patients. Their safety and tolerability of ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors appear very favorable. ARNI demonstrating lesser risk of worsening renal failure or hyperkalemia, but more symptomatic hypotension compared to ACE inhibitors. SGLT2 inhibitors showing no excess of hypoglycemia, ketoacidosis, symptomatic hypotension, worsening renal function, hyperkalemia regardless of diabetes, age, or renal function, but increased risk of genital infection when compared to placebo. As shown on this slide, in the EMPEROR trial, hypoglycemic events were not increased even in patients without di diabetes with empagliflozin. And empagliflozin treatment resulted in reduction in hemoglobin A1c in patients with diabetes, but not in patients without diabetes or prediabetes. And similarly, empagliflozin was not associated with any increases in volume depletion or hypotension, regardless of diabetes, renal function, age, ejection fraction, systolic blood pressure, or background therapy with ARNI. It's also important to recognize that these benefits were apparent on top of very optimized background therapies in these studies, reflecting over 90% of the trial population being treated with RAS inhibitors or beta blockers, and over 70% being treated with MRA. And there was no heterogeneity according to background therapy. Benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors were consistent across all subgroups of background medications examined even including those on or not on ARNI, showing a similar benefit on patients with concomitant treatment of background therapy with ARNI. There's also evidence of cardiometabolic beneficial effects of these agents. In DAPA-HF trial, dapagliflozin prevented new onset of diabetes in HEFREF patients without diabetes and without causing hypoglycemia. And in the PARADIGM trial, ARNI was associated with improved glycemic control in HEFREF patients with diabetes. So if we examine the armamentarium of life-saving medications in heart failure with reduced EF, recent trials support addition of SGLT2 inhibitors to the standard therapies of HEFREF, along with beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists solidifying the basis for a quadruple standard core therapy. If we examine additional therapies in HEFREF, we have two new medications. The first one is Verisiguat, an oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator resulting in enhancement of cyclic GMP production, which has favorable effects in myocardial remodeling, vascular stiffness, and prevention of fibrosis and has been studied in the Victoria trial in HEFREF patients. The second, agents is, second agent is Omecaptive, a novel selective cardiac myosin, my, myosin activator, which stabilizes the myosin in the pre-power stroke state and increases uh, duration of systole without increasing myocyte calcium or oxygen consumption, and has been studied in HEFREF patients in the recently published Galactic heart failure trial. If we look at these two trials together, though agents differed significantly, 
trial enrollment and pop, uh, population and the results were quite similar. Both studies enrolled sicker heart failure with reduced EF patient population with history of heart failure hospitalizations and elevated natural peptide levels. In the Victoria trial with Vericiguat, the oral guanylate cyclase stimulator, patients with systolic blood pressure less than 100 or EGFR less than 15 were excluded. In galactic HF with omecaptive mecarbil, the cardiac myosin activator, inpatients as well as outpatients could be enrolled, and only patients with systolic blood pressure less than 85 or EGFR less than 20 were excluded. Both agents resulted in modest but significant reductions in the combined endpoints of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization rates, mostly attributable to reduction in heart failure events, but failed to show any improvements in cardiovascular death. Both studies had evidence of significant heterogeneity in the subgroup analysis. In Victoria, patients with the highest quartile of natriuretic peptide levels did not appear to benefit from very sick blood, raising the possibility of requiring sick, but not too sick for patients to confer benefit from very sick blood. In galactic HF, there appeared to be benefit in patients with EF less than, but not over 28%. And though there was no other heterogeneity in other subgroups in the galactic trial with omecamtiv, sicker patients with NYHA class three to four also appear to have more benefit. There were no differences according to patients enrolled as inpatient or outpatient or according to anti-proBNP or blood pressure levels. Regarding their effect on patient reported outcomes, which is quite important for our patients, we currently do not have effect, uh, any data on the effects of Vericiguat in quality of life in HEPREF patients. We're awaiting for the results to be released. In galactic, omecamptive treatment appeared to be associated with a meaningful improvement in quality of life, but missed the specified uh, p-value of 0.025. They had to split their alpha and thus did not reach the statistical significance. Regarding their effects on remodeling, Vericiguat did not result in reverse remodeling. Omecamptive has been shown to result in improvement in LV chamber volumes stroke volume in an earlier phase two cosmic trial, and we will need to wait for further analysis from the galactic trial whether there will be any evidence of reverse remodeling with omecamptive, despite lack of benefit in cardiovascular death results. Both agents appear to be safe and well tolerated without any excess of serious adverse events or effects on electrolytes or kidney function compared to placebo. In Victoria trial, Vericiguat resulted in a trend for higher risk of symptomatic hypotension and syncope. In galactic HF, there was no evidence of hypertension, in fact, no effect on blood pressure, but there was a minimal increase in troponin I in the magnitude of 0.004 without any increased event rate for myocardial ischemia or ventricular arrhythmia, contrary to the COSMIC-2 phase two trial. If we examine the baseline characteristics of patients in the recent HEPREF trials, both galactic and Victoria trials have one of the highest proportions of patients with NYHA class three to four heart failure. NT pro BNP and annualized placebo event rates appear to be the highest in the Victoria trial, followed by galactic, and then emperor reduced trials reflecting sicker heart failure population. Baseline blood pressure is lowest in the galactic HF trial with omecamptiv, with a blood pressure around 110. Of note, 20% of the patients in the galactic trial with omecaptive were on background therapy with ARNI, and about 3% were treated with background therapy with SGLT2 inhibitors. So at this point, beyond the standard core therapies of beta blockers, RAS inhibitors with ACE or ARNI, MRA or SGLT2 inhibitors, or hydralazine and, isos and isosorbide in African-Americans, management of heart failure with reduced EF can also be individualized according to special populations and disease phenotypes, such as 
Ivabridine for patients with elevated heart rate despite optimal doses of beta blockade. Or perhaps, perhaps, Vericiglide for patients with weakening worsening of heart failure, but those who are not hypotensive or with markedly elevated natriuretic peptide levels over 5,000. Or omecantive for patients currently or with history of hospitalization for heart failure, perhaps with lower blood pressure and or lower EF. It's also important to recognize that there is evolving evidence, not only for morbidity and mortality, but also for reversal of remodeling, quality of life, functional capacity, and other important patient reported outcomes with all of these expanding therapies, providing valuable information for patients when they question us, as well as the clinicians. Clinicians can now advise patients on effects of these medications on survival, morbidity, prevention of hospitalization, symptoms, and quality of life. And as can be seen, not all medications that improve survival improve quality of life or vice versa. And therapies also need to be formulated according to patient goals and preferences. It's also important to recognize that beyond initiation of these standard therapies for heart failure, it's critical that the clinicians should make every effort to diagnose and treat the specific etiology, which may require specific treatment strategies, not in the exact sequence, as I mentioned, for standard therapies, or even including those agents, such as for the diagnoses uh, that are listed on the right panel, like amyloidosis or tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. As shown in the lower left panel, we now have specific therapies such as tafamidus associated with mortality benefit in patients with transretin amyloid cardiomyopathy. There's also evolving evidence specific for treatment of comorbidities and heart failure, such as beneficial effects of HGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with diabetes, systolic blood pressure treatment target to less than 130 in hypertension patients, treatment of iron deficiency, not even requiring the patient to be anemic, just iron deficiency with IV iron in patients with HFREF, and management of valvular heart disease, such as mitral regurgitation, after optimization of GDMT. It's also critical and humbling to recognize that despite expansion of evidence-based therapies, registries of real-world patients over the last 20 years show quite disappointing trends with no improvement in ACE or ARB use. These are generic medications which have remained in approximately 60% range of indicated patients, beta blockade at 80%, and MRA use very low at 35% of the indicated patients. When examined, unfortunately, the reasons are not predominantly due to patient intolerance, but rather provider inertia, inadequate follow-up, inadequate care coordination, gaps in payer coverage, and perhaps system failure. Evidence with these new life-saving therapies raises the question whether the traditional approach of a stepwise up titration to full dose before adding the next medication according to the order of chronology sequence of trials should be abandoned and replaced by a quicker combination of titration strategies. Though we do not have randomized data comparing these exact two approaches, the results of a recent cross-trial analysis that examined the imputed benefit of incremental risk reduction with lifetime use of comprehensive therapy of ARNI plus beta blockade plus MRA plus SGLT2 inhibitors in chronic HFREF compared against ACE or ARB and beta blockade resulted in a significant improvement of added survival benefit, all-cause survival benefit, uh, that would equate to approximately six to seven additional years of life for a 55-year-old patient with HFREF. 
And also the recognition that the very early benefits seen with ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors with separation of curves starting before three months emphasizes the importance of not delaying these life-saving therapies. In summary, evidence supports that the foundational course medical therapy in patients with HEFRES should include RAS inhibitors with ACE inhibitors or ARNI, beta blockers, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitors, not necessarily initiated in a sequential or delayed manner, while focusing also on specific etiologies that may warrant specific treatment, individualization of additional therapy according to race, comorbidities, disease phenotypes and risk, trajectories with shared decision according to patient goals, while not delaying initiation and optimization due to inertia, perceived stability, or presumed intolerability of patients. And it's also important not to forget lifestyle modification through the continuum of heart failure, as there is benefit with physical activity and certain lifestyle modification approaches for prevention of progression of heart failure. A few words about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Guidelines reflect emphasis on treatment of underlying etiology and comorbidities in HEP tests, such as treatment of blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, ischemia, and decongestion with diuretics. In 2017, Due to TopCat results, a new recommendation was added as a class 2B recommendation in appropriately select patients with hep PEF with evidence of recent or history of heart failure hospitalizations and elevated BNP levels. Aldosterone receptor antagonists might be considered to decrease hospitalizations. And this was in addition to the pre-existing class 2B recommendation of ARBs to reduce heart failure hospitalizations in heart failure with preserved EF. In 2019, we had the results of Paragon trial in which secubitral valsartan did not significantly reduce total hospitalization and cardiovascular death in patients with HEFPEF, but resulted in improvements in quality of life. The nominal reduction in heart failure hospitalizations did not reach significance with a borderline P value and there was no effect in cardiovascular death. There was significant heterogeneity with specific interactions in subgroups of sex and LVEF, suggesting possible benefit with the cubital valsartan in patients with lower ejection fraction and in women. Another study looking at role of variciguat was also studied in heart failure with preserved EF in a phase two dose finding study and failed to demonstrate any improvement in quality of life, six-minute walk distance, anti-proBNP, and left atrial volumes over a course of 12-week treatment in HEPTEC patients. We have a variety of ongoing studies, predominantly with SGLT2 inhibitors, also with spironolactone and non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists such as finerenone as well as devices such as interatrial shunt devices in HEFPEC patients. A few words about acute decompensated heart failure. We do not have many new studies, but last year we published an expert consensus pathway document for patients hospitalized with acute heart failure, which focuses on trajectories of what happens to the patient when they're in the hospital. This is critical which provides management guidance according to patients who demonstrate improvement after admission. They respond to therapy and what should we do to optimally discharge them versus those who initially improve them stall that we cannot optimally decongest them and feel pressure to discharge them versus those who do not improve and worsen. These trajectories are important for us to focus on to come up with optimal decongestion management strategies, of course, aligned with the patient goals. We also had the results of the PIONEER trial, which examined the efficacy and safety of initiation of the cubital valsartan in hospitalized heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction after initial stabilization. 
demonstrating significant reduction in anti-pro BNP levels, which was the primary endpoint. The safety of secubitril valsartan in hospitalized heart failure patients um, demonstrated lesser incidence of worsening renal function and hyperkalemia, but more adverse events related to hypotension. We recently heard the results of the SOLOIST trial, which examined the efficacy and safety of sotagliflozin, a dual sodium glucose co-transporter 1 and 2 inhibitor in patients with diabetes, hospitalized with heart failure regardless of EF, and which showed significant reduction in total cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, and urgent heart failure visits. As seen on this slide, these recent therapies have resulted in significant reductions in absolute risk and number needed to be treated to prevent one additional cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations. In the range of 20 to 50 patients in the outpatient HEPREF trials with ARNI or SGLT2 inhibitors, and as low as six to seven patients in RALS and SOLOIS, the acute uh, decompensated heart failure patients uh, with diabetes trial. As can be seen in the soloist trial, there were no differences among subgroups initiated on sotagliflozin before and after discharge or in reduced or preserved ejection fraction. I want to say a few words about stages of heart failure with a focus on stage A. As you remember, we uh, categorize our patients as stage A at risk for heart failure, but without structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure, or stage B with structural heart disease without signs or symptoms of heart failure. C, which is the type of patients I've been talking about since the beginning, uh, those patients with structural heart disease with prior or current symptoms of heart failure, or D, refractory heart failure requiring advanced therapies. If we examine the epidemiology of heart failure in the spectrum of um, heart failure from stages A to D, majority of our heart failure patients are in stage A or B status. In US alone, with approximately 100 million patients with obesity, about 115 million with hypertension, approximately one third of the US population could be categorized as stage A or at risk for heart failure. Why is this important? We have now a very robust portfolio of studies demonstrating benefit, prevention of heart failure for patients with diabetes who did not have history of heart failure, demonstrating significant reduction in cardiovascular death and heart, fa heart failure hospitalizations with SGLT2 inhibitors. These were studies carried out in patients with diabetes, with established cardiovascular disease, or those with risk of cardiovascular disease. This raises the question whether we can determine which diabetic patients are gonna be going towards the heart failure path, or which diabetic patients are gonna be at a higher risk of heart failure. Because there are other agents for diabetes that are associated with reduction in MACE or major other cardiovascular endpoint um, reduction, um, such as GLP-1 agonists, and a variety of agents associated with improvement in renal outcomes, including HGLT2 inhibitors. I want to talk about one study for stage A, for screening of heart failure. And this was a study called the STOP HF trial, looking at screening with natriuretic peptides that was conducted in approximately 1,300 patients with cardiovascular risk, such as diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, but without heart failure or LV dysfunction. They screened patients with annual BNP levels. And this was a randomized study. The randomization was to natriuretic peptide screening versus usual care, which did not entail screening. If the BNP levels were increased over 50, I'm not using the terminology of elevated because 50 is pretty much could be con uh, conceived amongst a normal uh, range 
in certain populations. If the NP levels increased over 50, patients were referred to multidisciplinary management, including a cardiology provider, and had enhanced imaging and treatment strategies targeting their risk, and resulted in significant reduction in uh, uh, MACE endpoints and prevention of future heart failure development, and very interestingly, future development of LV dysfunction, either HEFREF or HEFBEF. What they actually did was use of increased um, utilization of RAS therapies among patients with risk. This resulted in addition of a new recommendation in 2017 in heart failure guidelines for patients at risk of developing heart failure, natriuretic peptide by a marker-based screening followed by team-based care, including a cardiovascular specialist, optimizing GDMT can be useful to prevent development of left ventricular dysfunction, systolic or diastolic, or new onset heart failure. There have been attempts for characterization of a higher risk phenotype profile for heart failure among patients with diabetes and trying to predict who would really benefit uh, more with HGLT2 inhibitors among patients with diabetes. Uh, in a recent study by Berg and colleagues, they came up with a score that utilized atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, CKD, and microalbuminuria as a risk score and were able to identify a higher risk of patients who had a higher risk of development of heart failure and also benefited more from SGLT2 inhibitors. This raises the question whether we can define a higher risk for patients in stage B or stage A by utilization of biomarkers such as natriuretic peptide levels or even microalbuminuria in patients with diabetes, prompting consideration of heart failure-specific prevention treatment strategies, such as those with SGLT2 inhibitors. Our current heart failure guidelines emphasize specific guideline-rated medical therapies, either after recognition of LV systolic dysfunction or after traditional risk factors. However, new screening strategies emphasizing pre-heart failure state by these biomarker risk profiling can help us move enhancement of treatment strategy towards stage A, and also rather than treatment of traditional risk to prevention of risk. So in summary, the treatment in 2021 entails core medical therapy in heart failure with reduced EF that will include beta blockade, RAS inhibition with ACE inhibitors, ARBs or ARNI, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors as the scaffold or foundation of heart failure with reduced EF, but also needs to be built on with further diagnostic strategies that should be carried out to define specific etiology that may warrant a specific treatment. Further individualization according to patient characteristics, such as use of hydralazine isosorbide in African Americans, and perhaps consideration for other therapies, such as a very Siguat or Omicamptiv for sicker heart failure patients, perhaps on a captive even in hypotensive patients. Treatment of comorbidities with HGLT2 inhibitors in diabetic heart failure patients. Targeting therapies to a blood pressure of less than 130 for treatment of hypertension in heart failure. Treatment of iron deficiency anemia with IV iron and also individualizing therapies according to risk, trajectories, comorbidities, patient goals, entailing lifestyle modification, and focusing on optimization of therapies through the continuum of heart failure 
without inertia or presumption of stability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Boskert, for a truly amazing and most comprehensive look at where are we in treatment of heart failure. And it's not only the symptomatic ones. I think your, your view of early, early prevention in patients conceivably at risk would be even more beneficial, as we know. Uh, I think that was amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> Thank you for taking such a, you know, so much new data. So so much data that we the last two years and, or even one year that we've had and, and taking that such a, as usual, a complex uh, data set and, and making it seem so simple. Um, we appreciate that. And there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, and so Are just, you ready for a lot of questions? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I wanted to uh, just touch on Dr. Zogby's point about our emphasis on prevention because the new paradigm will entail for us to work in a multidisciplinary manner with, um, um, as heart failure doctors with um, not only specialists in, in cardiology but with endocrinology, with renal doctors and thus uh, our um, experience um, or comfort level in using these cardiometabolic agents is critical. And how to screen these patients, I think we need to lead. I do know all of my colleagues at Methodist um, and overall in the cardiovascular venue, we're very proactive in creating new team structures, such as the TAVR model or the, um, the cardiac shock model. I think we need to develop these uh, new um, best practices in uh, screening for risk. And uh, right now, even though the guidelines uh, entailed uh, screening for heart failure with natriuretic peptides in 2017. The practice has not evolved. The payers and the insurance companies are not aware of this recommendation and people are still skeptical. How can I order a natriuretic peptide level and who will cover it? And thus we will need to be in a concerted effort to disseminate this information that this may be cost effective uh, partly because we will be identifying a higher risk of patients and will allow us to prevent, mitigate risk early on without seeing patients in stage C and D. And thus trying to push the paradigm earlier, timely, optimize, creates an armamentarium that provides a big responsibility for all of us to spearhead this initiative of let's treat this like cancer oncology did in the pre-level. <laughs> pre-heart failure level, pre-cancer level, or pre-heart failure level before it becomes too late. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to underline and emphasize that. Before going through the, the questions, I'm <coughs> glad we have some time to do this. Um, it was sobering to see that the uptake of polypharmacy treatment of heart failure the reduced ejection fraction, meaning using so many of the, of the newer drugs, is very low. And it is a challenge, plus at the same time an opportunity for you to be able to you know, affect the outcome of patients with heart failure. I'll take it from, a, from my perspective that the challenges that we're seeing is that maybe a general cardiologist or an internist who are treating heart failure they're, these patients are not necessarily going to the advanced heart failure programs, whatever, whatever they are. So the field has changed so much and people may feel uncomfortable using like four medications in, in heart failure, right? And that could be in addition to the other challenges that you have. So th there is a tremendous uh, opportunity, I would say, for education at multiple levels. I mean, similar to this grand rounds. <laughs> for people to start knowing what the field is, because if you go back 10 years ago or so, uh, you have almost two classes of agents that were not <laughs> you know, part of the armamentarium of, of using these drugs in patients with, with uh, you know, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And uh, you know, at times people feel uncomfortable using like four drugs at the same time, right, for, for these patients. And, uh, it looks to me that there's a tremendous opportunity to move the needle with that, with education predominantly. I have two um, approaches to that challenge, um, Dr. Zogby, and you nailed it. I mean, the, the, the champs 
uh, registry, which is the, the one of the slides I showed, the unfortunately disappointing results of no increase in the last 20 years for ACE or ARB or beta blockade and dismally for MRA um, is really disheartening. But um, the concept of we couldn't even achieve you know, optimization with three medications. How are we envisioning to achieve further optimization with four and five and maybe more? Um, probably goes with the following. Implementation science, which you're truly um, underlining the crux of the matter. We in heart failure lag behind in, in awareness and implementation. I don't think it's as complicated as we fear. Um, the standard armamentarium, the new medications, um, HGLT2 inhibitors do not require up titration, one dose. And, um, and of course, the, the RNA has a few steps. MRA, only two steps at most, you know, one dose and an up titration. Thus creates the concept of do we need clinics with APPs and or other individuals that are in a multidisciplinary manner that does these up titrations. A lot of the institutions like yourself and others are looking into these care delivery models. Um, so the one concept is bring the treatment to the frontier with family medicine physicians, internal medicine practitioners, hospitalists and others with a training like an ACLS training and um, uh, HFSA has an initiative for a certificate for people to feel comfortable in, in GDMT or optimization of medical therapies. And ACC has an initiative called the Transform HF that is going to work with looking at um, rewiring of the EMR to see how we could utilize um, smart technologies to guide the physician for up titration. AHA has a huge initiative for awareness campaign as well as learning health systems with health networks to see how we could incorporate this. The second answer I had is the other end of the spectrum when things become quite complicated when, with advanced stage D and when knowing when to refer. We on the advanced heart failure side also worry about patients not being referred in a timely manner and knowing when to. So we're trying to empower the front line, the general cardiologists, the internal medicine doctors, the advanced practitioners for standard therapies for the early stage A, B, C, heart failure, and then knowing when to refer to the advanced um, centers for stage D. And I think this is going to require definitely a initiative that's like cancer did. When you look at how cancer did this, pre-cancer screening is not on the oncologist side. Treatment of early is in concert with the oncologist specialist. And advanced therapies go with accredited centers that are not solely in tertiary partner centers. And how to do that is right now, I know, is um, debated um, both at the old society level, but I think we cannot wait um, and we should go ahead and empower the frontline providers on how to do this. And when we first started the beta blocker journey years ago, there was a lot of concern about people being able to use beta blockade. Now look at this, everybody understands how, everybody knows uh, what the doses are, everybody knows the agents. It required a wide dissemination of information. I think this is the reason why we need a very, um, I think, uh, concerted effort to increase education, awareness, implementation science, uh, align all our resources with sponsors um, as well as granting agencies to the implementation science on demonstrating how to do this, enhance and showcase best practices, teach everybody, and show that it's not hard. We certainly have a lot of work. You know, yeah. Should we go through some of the yeah. questions? Yeah, there's a lot of audience questions, so we'll dive in. Let's uh, do that. The, the first one is, Dr. Bosker, do you think that dapagliflozone and empagliflozone have similar effects in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction? Both reduce the composite cardiovascular endpoint related to reductions uh, there, and with dapagliflozone with reductions in heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death. However, empagliflozone only reduce heart failure hospitalizations and not cardiovascular death. Should we prefer one agent over another? I think in the uh, EMPA reduced EF, the power was not adequate enough to look at the cardiovascular death. 
if you look at the, um, the trend and or the, the confidence intervals for the risk reduction, it is very close. And in the meta-analysis I demonstrated with FIES and ED, um, it does reach the significance when both of them are taken into consideration. Given the similar magnitude of risk reduction, 25% risk reduction for cardiovascular death and hospital, heart failure hospitalizations combined, as well as concordance of all the other endpoints going in the same direction, um, I think the SGLT2 inhibitors, at least for HEFREP, appear to be, with epagliflozin and empagliflozin, similar, perhaps class. We will need to see a little bit more, a few more data to say it's a class effect. Um, but right now, I consider them uh, comparable or equivalent in terms of use in HEFREP. Um, the cardiovascular death signal is due to uh, reduce or inadequate power in uh, emperor reduce, not necessarily due to a different mechanism or a signal that we can discern from the trial results. Yeah. And I'll follow that up with, you know, if you have a patient with diabetes and heart failure, who do you think should be prescribing SGL2 inhibitors? Should it be cardiologists or their diabetes doctors? Everybody. <laughs> so the answer is, yes, cardiologists should start prescribing. First and foremost, HGLT2 inhibitors right now are a cardiology medication because, as I showed at the beginning, they work in HEFREP among patients without diabetes. So I don't want it to be solely perceived as a diabetes medication because we don't know exactly how they work, but they work in heart failure. And thus, it's a heart failure medication even amongst patients without diabetes, and thus cardiologists are expected to prescribe these agents. And we need to be very familiar. If the patient is first seen by an endocrinologist or an internal medicine uh, uh, physician, I'm hoping, especially with the recognition of their heart failure as a diagnosis or their risk by the features that I presented, that they would be treated with the appropriate agents such as SGLT2 inhibitors. And I do recognize the GLP-1 receptor agonists on the diabetology side are, uh, are seen as agents with benefit for reduction of ischemic endpoints or MACE endpoints in patients with diabetes. That's why I created that trifurcation of, in a patient with diabetes, how do we know which one is going to go to heart failure versus to the CAD ischemic events and or the renal? Um, and that's why we I think the screening concept or recognizing early risk or symptoms of heart failure is critical because once heart failure, the SGLT2 inhibitors are beneficial. In terms of um, data with GLP-1 receptor agonists, I didn't show the data. Currently, the meta-analyses reflect a neutral outcome for prevention of heart failure with GLP-1 receptor agonists. But in established heart failure patients, which was only one trial, small, um, a, a sample size of 300, the NHLBI sponsored study, when used in sicker, hospitalized, recently hospitalized heart failure patients, GLP-1 receptor agonist was associated with trends for worsening. So in established HEFREF patients who are sicker, we're a bit concerned with GLP-1 receptor agonists to be used for the heart failure indication, but overall they appear to be neutral for prevention of heart failure. Thank you. Um, next question is about OMBA-CAPTIV. And, and, uh, in view of the galactic heart failure trial showing more benefit in advanced patients with, with a lower EF, what do you think the role of that drug should be currently? First, let me um, touch on showing benefit in advance because subgroup analyses sometimes um, get misperceived. We see heterogeneity in subgroup analysis um, with a um, only in the EF less than 28%, meaning those um, subgroups appear to have a differing benefit with a higher level of benefit in lower EF. The other subgroups did not reveal heterogeneity by the p-values for subgroup analysis, but in the NYJ class three and four, the, the confidence intervals appeared on the more benefit side. 
with these uh, very subtle findings with subgroup analysis, I think we need to wait for the FDA to see whether um, the, the Omicaptive would be approved for use. If approved for use, the profile of safety, being able to use all the way down to a blood pressure of 85, actually creates a opportunity for us specialists for advanced heart failure, where the, sometimes the limitation is the blood pressure. Um, in the very advanced stages, as we all know, the blood pressure um, is one of the, the limiting factors, um, and thus being able to use it also for inpatients as well as outpatients in sicker populations, I think creates an opportunity. Um, in those who have high high or good blood pressure where I could optimize other medications, I would be optimizing the life-saving therapies first and optimize them to the optimal doses that were used in the clinical trials. After which, if I am unable to use the standard therapies, then um, for, you know, omega captive, that can come as an option. If I'm unable to use any of the other agents due to hypertension, it comes as an opportunity. And I think we need a little bit more data um, in advanced heart failure to see. And more importantly, um, Ari, as you know, we do not have any agents for the palliative uh, patients. We send them home with home IV, inotropic therapies. It would be so good for us to be able to use some of these agents that have a reasonable safety profile and potentially uh, benefit in improvements in um, symptoms though the quality of life didn't make it with a borderline p-value and, um, and, and e efficacy. And I think that's another patient population that hasn't been tested in clinical trials that the clinicians are so eagerly waiting for. Yeah, that's a great point. It'll be nice to have uh, options in, in the patients that are more sick, uh, absolutely. Um, next question is from one of our um, preventive colleagues, Dr. Kershaw Patel. How do you recommend deciding which patients should be screened with natriuretic peptides to evaluate heart failure risk? Great question. Um, I think the screening strategies need to be based on the population. Right? Um, you know, at the VA, um, most of my patients probably would have an abnormality when screened because they have CKD, they have um, you know, advanced age and comorbidities, and that the threshold of what I'm going to consider as abnormal or a pathway that is going towards heart failure. So the screening concept needs to be formulated for the population studies. But overall, right now, the study that I quoted, the stop hf trial screened patients with diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. And majority of the patients had one or the other, not all of the three. And I, right now, knowing with the benefit of results what we have seen for prevention of heart failure, with a magnitude of 35% risk reduction for prevention of heart failure with SGLT2 inhibitors, would be screening diabetic patients, would be screening patients with CKD, would be screening patients with um, a perhaps hypertension cluster with CAD. And I think we need a risk scoring very similar to what HAACC did for uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk calculator. And there are currently studies looking at a risk calculator that is going to look at the demographics to determine whom we need to do the additional biomarker screening. And particularly so if it changes I our approach and therapy. Certainly. So I think we have time for maybe just one or two brief questions. One is, um, should we consider treating HEFREF patients with a mixed etiology pulmonary hypertension? For, so for those in the audience, those that have a high wedge but also have a high transpulmonary gradient, uh, or those under consideration for heart transplant with elevated TPG with varisiguat? Great question. Uh, possibly, yes. Um, we don't... The problem is the subgroup analysis in, um, in Victoria, don't, because our advanced um, biventricular failure patients with high TPG, transpulmonary gradient, tend to be the ones that are the thickest and tend to be the ones with the highest level of anti pro BNP levels. The signal we got from the study, yes, it was a sick patient population, 
But then this whole anti pro BNT subgroup analysis, actually, uh, Justin Ezekovic did a subsequent analysis looking at a um, continuum of analysis of which patients or what cutoff the anti pro BNP <laughs> appeared, um, or patients over which they didn't uh, demonstrate benefit, showed it very consistently that over a certain level, over 5,000 or even, um, even higher, does not seem to benefit. Uh, mind you, it didn't look like there was adverse outcome, but that creates a question of maybe the pulmonary vasodilation concept, as you know, in, in advanced biventricular failure is a tricky concept in heart failure. Um, so I don't want to right now um, confer the results of what we know from PP8 studies with very cigar to the secondary pulmonary hypertension seen in HEF-REF. We did not get that safety signal um, and or efficacy, efficacy signal from the Victoria trial. Yeah. What do you think, Barry? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think right now, I think it's too early to, to use. Um, so I, I agree with you on waiting for more data. So I, I think <laughs> if, if, if I may ask one uh, last question, just to kind of close it out. I know we're running on time, but That's just to okay. go back to, you know, the polypharmacy and you know, certainly concerning for our patients. And, you know, I have a small minority of patients that will tell me, you know, give me the latest and greatest drug. I want everything you can throw at me, which is great. But most of my patients don't do that. Do you think we, we need big data you know, using AI, using, you know, genomics, transcriptomics to help guide us on how to individualize and personalize all these wealth of therapies now we have to offer? Partially, yes. Um, the reason is um, I think we're missing out on etiology a lot, um, especially in the non-ischemic patient population. <laughs> we don't seek the etiology most of the time. We just do standard therapies, but as we learn from amyloidosis, we're missing a lot of the, um, you know, truly the genetic causes and or opportunities for treatment. Um, and if this were to be simplified, because ordering a genetic test right now with a genetic counselor and so forth has so many layers and it's difficult. And even, um, you know, coordination of care, trying to capture all the data, microalbuminuria may be recognized by the nephrologist. And for me to order that, you know, understanding the concepts of what do I do with this? I think AI at that point with a learning health system where it may say, your patient has this contraindication and may benefit from this and has this, um, let's say, variant in terms of genetic and may not um, respond. You know, the non-responder is a big issue. Um, a genetic enhanced, uh, enhanced response is a great, great opportunity. And I think these are um, truly becoming a little bit complex but would allow us to work better. But the thing I'm also going to say from the other side of the coin, oncologists are not waiting for AI to do very coordinated, <coughs> molecular targeted, individualized precision medicine. When people use the word precision, it sounds esoteric yes. and or um, sounds as if it requires a very high tech AI technology. In essence, um, it just says, you know, treat according to specific causes. Um, and I think we need to embrace this now, not waiting for some, you know, very advanced EMR and or technology, but embrace. The smartwatches, the Apple study for AFib is very intriguing, right? And how we're going to utilize that in heart failure along with, you know, further detection of risk and treatment. I think these are all happening. Telehealth is here. You already are doing it. We're doing it. So how do we combine all these um, data points and who's going to be watching all this probably will need to be AI because we will not be able to absorb and capture all this data. And we're already recognizing the necessity to utilize the scoring um, you know, um, apps and so forth being so useful in decision making. And ACC and AHA has done a tremendous job in creating these little tools that helped uh, clinicians to be able to absorb a large scale of data and uh, change that into implementation. Well, Dr. Boskert, <clears throat> what a pleasure having you this morning. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience in, in this field, which is truly amazing. Uh, a lot of new developments, but I think application science is still very important for us to move the needle from our patients. So 
really exciting. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasquez. It's great. Thank, thank you. It was a pleasure to be with friends and colleagues and former mentors. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful.